There may be austerity in government, but at Defense Headquarters in Ottawa, the lid is off on spending for new military hardware. Sometime this fall, the federal cabinet will pick one or possibly two new fighters for this country's tiny and rundown air force. The generals want to take delivery of as many as 150 new fighters by the mid-1980s. At close to two and a half billion dollars in today's money, it will be Canada's biggest single military spending program. And already, inflation and the weak dollar are pushing the cost higher and higher. But the defense planners say it will all be worth it because the new fighters we're considering are the very best that billions of dollars can buy. Fighter pilots call these the ultimate in killer airplanes. They can fly at more than twice the speed of sound and climb 20 miles into the sky. They carry devastating weapons that can destroy other aircraft or lay waste to targets on the ground 50 to 100 miles away. They have cannons that fire 100 rounds a second and missiles that twist and turn in the sky using heat sensors or radar to find their targets. These are the fancy new toys in the international arms market, and the generals in Ottawa like to keep models perched on their office bookcases until they can get their hands on the real thing. Let's take a look at our choices. This is the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. It can track 24 targets at once and launch six missiles at a time, each of them whizzing off in a different direction. The General Dynamics F-16. They call it a little moon rocket with wings because it can climb to 40,000 feet faster than a Titan intercontinental ballistic missile. The Northrop F-18 Cobra. Small, agile, and menacing. They'll build only five Cobras this year, but eventually the American Navy will have 800, and it'll be the most advanced of all the new fighters. The European Tornado. It has wings that swing back all on their own, making it one of the best for low-level strafing. The McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle. It can stay in the air for hours. The Eagle can carry seven tons of weapons from the West Coast over the Arctic Islands to Labrador without ever landing for fuel. It's the unofficial favorite among Canadian Air Force generals. Few other countries demand as much of a single military airplane as Canada does. The new fighter that is chosen must be able to carry out long-range interceptions and surveillance missions over the coastlines and the Arctic. It must also work as an air-to-ground support plane for this country's NATO forces in Europe. If we need any new fighter at all, maybe we need two, one for each of these jobs. We have two now, the Starfighter in Europe for our NATO role and the Voodoo long-range interceptor for NORAD, the North American Air Defense role. When Soviet bombers venture close to Canadian coastal airspace, it's the Voodoo that goes out to meet them. The Voodoos have been around since 1952, and they've been part of Canada's air defense since 1961. The Air Force says they won't last much beyond 1980. The other plane, the Starfighter, was past its prime even in 1962, when Canada bought 238 of them. Although it has never fought a real battle, it has left a trail of death and destruction. Pilots call it the flying bomb, or the widow maker because a mistake at the controls can have immediate and catastrophic results. 93 of our starfighters have crashed, killing 32 Canadian pilots. The West Germans have lost more than 100, like this one. German pilots at one point threatened not to go up in the planes ever again. Like Canada, the Germans are now getting rid of their starfighters. The starfighter has not been our only questionable fighter plane purchase. In the mid-60s, we were out shopping again. This time, we acquired over a hundred freedom fighters against the advice of our own military. 
These lightweight dive bombers were never meant to take the place of the starfighters and voodoos, but they were expected to be able to go rushing off to Norway on short notice to defend NATO's northern flank. Even that, however, meant a nerve-wracking in-air refueling. Canada bought the Freedom Fighter 12 years ago because it was dirt cheap, $700,000 a copy. But the bargain turned out to be a disastrous financial nightmare. Northrop Corporation, the manufacturer, sued the government for reselling some of the Freedom Fighters to Venezuela. To settle out of court, Canada paid $9 million. Meanwhile, Canadair, the Montreal company that assembled the plane, blamed Ottawa for cost overruns and demanded money. When all the bills were paid, the Freedom Fighters ended up costing more than $2 million each. And the final act to this expensive farce occurred when the Trudeau government cut back drastically on our NATO commitment. So ironically, about a third of the 105 planes we purchased in 1966 are sitting here in mothballs in an air base in Trenton, Ontario. We are assured that they will be dusted off someday and used as advanced trainers. Canada is subject to special pressures when it comes to the purchase of military aircraft. First, there is our dual service requirement at home with NORAD and in Europe with our NATO commitment. And then, of course, the government wants to use the purchase in order to provide more jobs for Canadians. It's important to our economy. This is NORAD headquarters in Colorado. As a partner in NORAD, Canada is obliged to carry her weight in defending the North American continent against an assumed Soviet bomber threat. Subtle American pressure exerted through NORAD is not lost on people like General Paul Manson, the man who's heading Canada's new fighter selection committee. As a result of all the work that we've done, we are convinced that what Canada really needs is uh, a multi-role, high-performance aircraft. And to buy anything less, I think, would be a, uh, a waste of money because you'd have an aircraft that would cost almost as much, but which would do far less. All of the contenders in the Canadian competition claim to have multi-role fighters, but there is still some question as to whether they can meet Canada's needs. This Tomcat, for example, is one of the hottest and most versatile numbers in the running. Yet its manufacturers, Grumman Aerospace, have doubts that even it could fulfill the two Canadian roles. I spoke to Grumman Vice President John O'Brien. There is no doubt that this airplane can fulfill your NATO commitment. But in fact, your NATO commitment is perhaps 180 degrees opposite to your Canadian commitment. And that's a frustration for those of us who are trying to supply you airplanes and probably for your people who are trying to buy them because no one airplane can satisfactorily do both jobs. In spite of such warnings, the Minister of Defense, Barney Danson, still hopes to be able to avoid buying two aircraft. I hope we can do it with one type of aircraft throughout the whole system. That may not be possible. We might have to go to two uh, different types. Uh, but uh, the initial price is going to be extremely important and uh, once we determine uh, the number of aircraft we can buy, then we're looking at the industrial benefits that flow from the program. Industrial benefits. When most other countries buy new airplanes, they pay cash. But Canada places heavy demands on its arms suppliers. The government wants not only a deadly weapon, but jobs. The competing airplane builders are eager to oblige and the competition is intense. They've sent tons of paper into Ottawa offering fat contracts for companies here. Final assembly of the new fighter at factories in Canada, reinvestment of 70 to 80 percent of the purchase price in supply contracts for Canadian companies, and more. Like good foot-in-the-door salesmen everywhere, the arms peddlers are brimming with promises that the customer wants to hear. We've constructed what we consider to be an excellent program for industrial benefits. The industrial offset program will run for about 14 years. We would ensure that Canadian industries are participating. We expect to create significant jobs, and we've defined that in our proposal. And we're not talking just about the uh, Canadian order. We're talking about a share in the main program. For Those Barney essential. Danson, the new fighter program poses a moral problem. Jobs are nice, as long as they aren't all in the arms industry. I'm not at all anxious to see Canada build up a, um, a defense in industry. First of all, then you make your military de decisions based on your industrial capability, which is a bad military decision, but also you have a vested interest in, in armaments, which I don't think is a very attractive position for Canada to be in. You're forced and those industries are slow to go out and sell them to countries you wouldn't want to. Uh, you, have, uh, you don't have the same interest in disarmament, which uh, I think is a very strong interest of Canada's. Uh, and um, 
uh, it distorts uh, all, all, all of your, your values in, uh, in this way. The neat packages of industrial benefits being hustled by the arms sellers are not giveaways by any means. These people are in business for big profits, and there's a pile of money to be made in the Canadian sale. There's also an ironic twist to the competition. The new fighters are getting too expensive, even for the lavish defense budget in Washington, and the Americans are buying their planes over longer periods of time to lessen the pinch. The manufacturers are scrambling to make up the difference by selling to Canada, so a sale here would safeguard jobs in the United States. So we need aircraft to fulfill two specific roles, and we may ultimately find that we'll have to purchase two different kinds of planes. We also want more jobs for Canadians at a time when unemployment in the United States is a tough problem for the manufacturers themselves. It's a difficult decision facing Barney Danson. Five different kinds of planes, each with their own advantages and shortcomings. Let's examine them again. The F-16, a lightweight, single-seat fighter that will soon become the mainstay of the American Air Force. General Dynamics says the F-16 can do just about everything that it has only one engine, and there are fears that it might not stand up to long flights over remote northern areas. The company is plying Canada with all kinds of inducements to buy the F-16. Final assembly of the plane in Canada and contracts for suppliers of components across the country. But there's a catch. The F-16 is no longer the bargain basement fighter that it started out to be. Two years ago, four NATO countries bought the F-16 for $6 million per plane. Everyone marveled at the price, but inflation quickly left its mark. This year, the Americans expect to pay more than $10 million per plane. Nothing out of the ordinary if you listen to John Lammers. And there is a difference of $1.2 billion spread over... Lammers is a smooth-talking number cruncher for General Dynamics. He can make the cost increase look like a decrease. The difference is the result of a change in ground rules for economic escalation. If you look at the difference which is attributed to the program itself, you will find out that the difference is not an increase, but is rather a very slight decrease. So the government changes its ground rules from time to time on how they're going to apply this economic escalation. In other words, it's a prediction on how the dollar is going to change in value, and these affect the dollar cost of a program. The General Accounting Office in Washington found some technical problems with the F-16. Investigators said the fighter won't stand up to enemy attack as well as it should because these gas lines are too vulnerable to shell bursts. The GAO also said the powerful F-16 engine was prone to quitting at low speeds. In the fighter plane business, even a little thing like a faulty landing gear can have hair-raising results. General Dynamics says the faults have all been corrected, but the F-16 is only now going into mass production. Other planes in the competition, like the Tornado, are also in their infancy. The Tornado is a twin-engine fighter being built by Britain, Germany, and Italy. They're making two models. One is an interceptor, the other an air-to-ground attack plane. The Tornado will sell for around $14 million in today's money and the three-country consortium is offering to make Canada a full partner in future sales if we buy it. So Canada could get back more than it invests in the tornado. That's the promise being made by tornado builders, but it's based on the hope that many countries will buy the airplane and that Canada will want to dirty its hands in the international arms market. Ironically, Canada was an original member of the international consortium that set out to design and build a new fighter but we pulled out in 1968. The Tornado too has its controversies. One senior German Air Force officer will soon publish a book declaring the plane to be a costly disaster. He says the plane is far too complicated for the relatively simple air to ground role expected of it in Europe. It's too much for even a two man crew to handle, he says. One mistake and they could die in their ejection seats. Then there's the Eagle. It's been criticized on similar grounds. Too much plane for its single pilot under stress. But at McDonnell Douglas, such talk is heresy. They don't mince words about their entry. They say nothing can match it. With its two engines going full blast, the Eagle once zoomed 100,000 feet into the stratosphere. It's the plane that both the Israelis and the Arabs want. 
The Americans plan to have over 700 eagles, but in Washington there is tough talk of scaling down purchases. The reason is money. The eagle costs a bundle, and McDonnell Douglas is under the gun for cost overruns. Two years ago, the price was $13 million, and now it's just over $18 million. The company is well connected in Canada, with a factory in Toronto turning out parts for passenger planes, and a full-time lobbyist in Ottawa, William Baker. As Canadian Vice President for McDonnell Douglas, Baker doesn't like all the talk about his company's cost overrun problems. Well, I, I can't give you an individual price at this stage. Uh, uh, cost overruns are generally related to the inflationary pressures. And he grows testy if you ask him about stories in American military circles that the eagle is no match for the Grumman Tomcat in a dogfight. I'm not about to talk about my competitors' products in comparison to mine. The, of course, we are very concerned because we want to make sure yeah, if we're going yes, to go but for the there best. There are talented people who can make that evaluation. And neither you nor I nor the general public have the capability to evaluate these things. This is the Cobra. Northrop has just started building this twin-engine little fighter, and it won't be available in large numbers until the mid-1980s. But when it arrives, the Cobra will have the most advanced navigation and weapon systems of them all. The top-secret technology going into the Cobra is so sensitive that not even the high-spending Shah of Iran can buy the airplane. Price is turning into a problem with the Cobra as well. It was supposed to be a relatively cheap fighter for the American Navy. By the time the new airplane is ready for delivery, however, the cost will be over $18 million. That brings us to the last entry, the Tomcat. The Tomcat is the biggest, the most expensive, and the most lethal of all the new fighters. It carries the Phoenix missile, which can seek out and destroy an enemy target more than 100 miles away. They built this plane to operate from aircraft carriers and conduct long missions over water. The Tomcat is the chief new weapon for the American Navy, and Grumman, the builder, says it's a natural for Canada. To sweeten their offer, Grumman is promising 15,000 new jobs in Canada if we buy their plane, and 80% of the purchase price will be invested in contracts in this country but the Tomcat has had just about every problem that can beset a complex new weapon. The cost, for example, has risen so sharply that the Americans are spreading their purchases over an extra two years. When the first F-14 Tomcat was finished in 1970, the price tag was just under $10 million. Now it's just under $20 million if you go by the Grumman Aerospace Corporation, or $28 million if you look at the U.S. Navy's new budget for fighter planes. By the time Canada would take delivery in 1981, nobody can quite say how much we would have to pay. John O'Brien of Grumman Aerospace says he'll quote you any figure you want. The cost will be, with all the equipment and extra supplies that you have to buy for a new airplane, probably on the order of $23, $24 million a copy. At $23 to $24 million a piece in today's dollars, Canada could afford only 97 planes like this on its existing budget, not the 120 to 150 that the Air Force wants. But the Tomcats' problems didn't end with cost. 25 Tomcats have crashed in their eight-year lifespan, and seven American flyers have died. The throttles on this Tomcat jammed, and it went rolling into the sea, although the pilots got out in time. There was an expensive recovery operation to keep it out of the hands of Soviet salvage crews. Investigators blame pilot error for some of the crashes, but they've also found a devastating problem with the engines. Fan blades inside the engines were breaking off and literally tearing the Tomcats apart. The pilots ejected just in time in this Tomcat crash at Riverhead, New York. The word is that the Tomcat engine problems have been solved, but the American Navy still wants to spend more than $3 billion on an all-new engine. If Canada buys the Tomcat, it will be with the old engine. For Canadian defense planners, the stakes have never been higher. There are perils at every turn, and one mistake could turn the new fighter program into a costly disaster. If prices in the risky and volatile aerospace industry go up by 10% a year, a reasonable expectation, 
the new fighter will end up costing Canadian taxpayers more than three and a half billion dollars. Already worried military men are looking at ways to scrape by on a limited force of 108 new planes or fewer, a cutback that would spread the Air Force thin indeed. There have been serious blunders in past military spending in Canada, and this time the decision makers are determined that it's all going to go smoothly, but the potential for disaster remains sky high.